I'm the field crop pathologist with Manitoba Agriculture in Carmen, and I'm happy to uh, introduce three speakers this afternoon who will be talking on crop diseases, new and old. We're actually going to start with the old first. That has nothing to do with Jim's age, although I first met him around 1988 in Vancouver when he was a young scientist at Agassiz. And then he was working with using silicon to control powdery mildew on greenhouse cucumbers. He did his uh, PhD work at Guelph, and there he was working on powdery mildew of wheat. So um, since he moved to Manitoba, Jim has been working with cereals exclusively. We consider him the smut specialist of cereals, but he also works with rusts, and that's what he's here to talk to us about today, crown rust in oats, and why it was a big deal this year. Uh, Justine Cornelson is also here in person. She'll be our second speaker, and she's going to be talking about a verticillium stripe in canola. Um, Justine has been working in the industry for about 10 years and uh, with the Canola Council of Canada. Right now, she's with Brett Young Seeds. Um, she completed her master's here at the U of M, although she did her undergrad at uh, the university in Brandon. Uh, she currently lives in Verdon and has a lot of horses where she lives. Uh, Dr. Shama Chatterton can't be with us in person, but she is uh, going to join us online. She's at Lethbridge, a research scientist, young research scientist, started there in uh, 2011. And she's focused primarily on diseases of pulse crops and special crops. And she has a fascination with Aphanomyces root rot in particular, and uh, working towards uh, some kind of control for that troublesome disease of field peas and other pulses. Without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to Jim. I'm just gonna mention that we are doing a poll with each of the three speakers, and you'll find that on uh, menti.com. I think that comes up as the first slide. Marla? Oh, I hit advance. Okay, let's see if I can do it. No? Up the other way. Up the other way. There we go. Um, so with your cell phones, if you can log on to menti.com and enter that eight-digit code, um, there are three questions, one for each of these three speakers, and you'll see a, a bar graph, uh, no, pie chart showing what your answers were. So, sorry about all that. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes per speaker, and we're going to hold questions until the end of their talks. So, Jim. Thank you, David. <laughs> it's funny, David and I always seem to end up s close to each other, no matter how much we change jobs. Um, so today, uh, I'm talking about crown, crown rust, uh, perennial concern in oats. Um, so I'm Jim Menzies. I work at the Morton Research and Development Center of AAFC. As David mentioned, I have responsibilities for crown rust of oats, uh, some responsibilities for stem rust of wheat, uh, the smut diseases, and ergot of wheat. So crown rust of oats is caused by the fungus Puccinia coronata var avinae, former specialis avinae, and I'm sure you haven't seen anything like that since you took plant pathology in undergrad. Uh, it's, the name has changed a couple of times if you don't recognize it, and these names tend to change. Uh, it's a worldwide distribution. Essentially, you can find it wherever oats are grown, except under conditions of very arid climate, because it needs uh, dew to infect. It's considered the most widespread and damaging disease of oat in the world. In Canada, it's economically significant, Ontario, Quebec, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan. Uh, and I'll put a little plug here, and that probably means that it's most important in Manitoba and Saskatchewan because that's where the oats are grown for the most part. 90% uh, of the uh, country's oats are grown on the prairies, 10% in the rest of Canada. It can cause yield losses of 10 to 40% under severe circumstances on average. Uh, but of course, that would mean some fields would be much higher than 40%, and it could cause very severe yield loss for the farmer. It can also affect the quality of the grain that is produced. So it is an issue to uh, old producers. Develops best during warm days, 20 to 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, moderate nights, 15 to 20 degrees Celsius, and as I mentioned, with good dew formation. Uh, it can also be spread long distances by wind. Like the other rusts, it's, it's a pathogen that moves on the Puccinia pathway, so that means every year, essentially, we get rust spores arriving in Canada from the southern US. So it can travel very long distances. 
Importantly, how do you control this? This is probably what you're interested in. Okay, so use resistant varieties, that certainly helps. And to find out what varieties are resistant in your area, consult your local seed guide. It will tell you what varieties are, be, are, in, are being sold in Manitoba or Saskatchewan, Alberta, depending on what seed guide you're using. And it will give you a rating for those lines for crown rust and other diseases. Um, this rating is generally developed over a two or three year period where different people across the country test these things and then we meet at the Prairie Grain Development Committee uh, every year and discuss what the ratings will be for lines that are going forward for registration. And that's the rating that line will have in the seed guides. Another thing to do is if you can seed early, the reason for doing this is crown rust tends to be blown in from the U.S. in late June, early July. So the sooner it matures, the less cycles of disease it will be exposed to. So it will have lower disease simply because it's just maturing early and avoiding inoculum buildup. Avoid buckthorn. So if you've got a field near a waterway and there's buckthorn there, uh, probably not a great idea to plant oats there because buckthorn is the alternative host of this pathogen. In other words, sexual reproduction occurs on buckthorn. So it's there all year, and so what it means is in the spring, when the spores are starting to be produced on the buckthorn, it will spread that much earlier to your oak crop. So uh, you'll have more chance for the disease to build up. Foliar applied fungicides, yes, they can be effective to reduce crown rust. Make sure the fungicide is registered for use on crown rust. That's a good thing always to think of. And read and follow the instructions on the label and or product information chain uh, pages. So, disease situation last few years. As you can see here, I'm not going to go through year to year, but as you can see, there were a couple of years, like 2019 and 2021, where actually disease levels of crown rust were quite low. And if you think back about it, those tended to be hot, dry years. Last year, actually it wasn't that bad as far as heat goes, and we had uh, precipitation at the right time. It was actually very high. So the mean incidence and percentage of plants infected in a field was about 38%. <coughs> Excuse me. About 97% of the fields we visited had crown rust, which meant that maybe one or two fields we visited did not. So in general, you could find it wherever you want. Uh, and the mean severity is 4 MRMS. Now that's generally the severity goes from resistant, moderate resistant, moderately or MRMS, and then moderately susceptible, most susceptible. That may not seem like much, but remember that's the mean severity. Some of these fields would have been much more severely affected, and there would, would have been yield loss. So let's talk about the pathogen. That's where I get excited. I love talking about the pathogen. Uh, this pathogen, I, I can't say it enough, is highly genetically variable. The Eastern and Western Canadian populations are quite different, but they are both highly genetically variable. The difference between the Eastern Canadian populations and the Western is the Western populations tend to have more virulence. In other words, genes that can overcome resistance. And the reason for this is because we have a history of breeding for disease resistance in the Canadian prairies <coughs> sorry, sorry, and on the Great Plains of the U.S. So the pathogen is constantly being uh, forced to try and adapt to new resistant lines. So it's highly variable. But what does that mean? Well, what it means is that uh, over a five-year period, I'm thinking the last five-year period, we identified approximately, from our surveys, we collect so many samples per year, and we identified approximately 454 races from about 500 isolates. 80% of those isolates would have been found in that, that five-year period once. One isolate over the five years. So, are there, can we look at it and say, are there races that are dominant? Honestly, in the crown rust world, if we find a race that's three or four percent, that's dominant. So, there's lots of races. It's constantly changing. So, other than the pathologist, you think, well, what does all this mean? What do I care? Okay, so this, what the real issue is, it becomes an issue with variety ratings. Like, people will say that they get lines that have this variety rating in the guide that says it's resistant, and it's not. <clears throat> the reason for this is because the pathogen population is changing so much. 
When that line went through the registration process, it probably was resistant. Three or four years later, maybe not. The average crown rust resistance gene uh, remains viable as an effective gene for resistance on average less than five years. So these ratings can change dramatically. And generally, we don't test the lines once they're registered. And the reason we don't is because it's commercial data now. At that point, it's not research data. And as a federal scientist, I'm not involved in commercial data. That I'm not supposed to be doing that. So we don't continue with testing unless they put it through the McVet trials, because we will test the McVet trials. But if the company chooses not to do that, it won't be tested. These are some uh, uh, examples of some of the genes. Uh, I'll just pick an easy one here. Uh, PC91, oh, sorry, oh, it's right here, PC91. That was found, when I, when I started working with crown rust about 12 years ago, that was the gene. That was gonna be resistant to everything and be fantastic in all these different cultivars. So we had some lines registered with PC91, like stainless in 2008, Saurus, and Justice 2013. We first noted an isolate with virulence to PC91 in 2012. Actually, sorry, at 6%. So probably, you know, we noticed eight isolates out of the, our samples. By 2015, it was at 67% of the isolates have virulence to PC91. Now, it's probably closer to 80. So, is this gene effective? Oh, two minutes? Okay. Probably not anymore. Uh, another one uh, is uh, PC94, also a very good gene. It's actually still quite effective right now. Regi first put out in Stride 2012, Liggett 2005, and CDC Big Brown has it, PC94. Fairness to PC94 was first noted in 2010 at about 5%. Now it remained low for many years, 2 to 5%. And now it's about 20%. So it's starting to go up. Honestly, it could be 60 to 80% next year. I don't know. We just have to see. It, the pathogen is just that variable. So, at the end of the day, what does it mean? Use resistant varieties. Go to the seed guide, and if it gives it a good resistance, I would use it anyway. Because even if the population, pathogen population is changed, Lines that had good resistance genes tend to do better than lines that never did have good resistance, even if the resistance is overcome. So I would still consider using the guide and looking at the ratings. And to be fair, some of those lines do have good resistance. <clears throat> so it's kind of luck of the draw, I'm sorry to say that, but those uh, resistant ratings have been done. There's a, been a lot of work behind those ratings. Fungicide applications, absolutely, you can use them, and they can be very, very effective. I will mention, though, one of the things that people don't think, worry, think about with fungicides is don't use the same fungicide again and again and again and again and again. Why? You're going to end up, I'm sorry, I'm getting excited here, uh, you're going to end up with resistance to fungicides. It's the same as a resistance gene. If you put a resistance gene out on a huge acreage, the pathogen will evolve to overcome that resistance. If you use the same fungicide over a large acreage, the pathogen will evolve to overcome that fungicide. So what you need to look at is perhaps a fungicide uh, rotation, different modes of actions in the fungicides. That's something I think I'd just like to throw that out there, but you should think about it. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Because I only have 10 minutes, we're going to whip through some intro slides really, really quick. Um, to any pathology talk, we got to identify what we're working with. So um, we are working with this disease in canola, which is called verticillium stripe. Um, and the causal pathogen here is verticillium longisporum. Um, so we do deal with other verticillium species here in Manitoba, but the one we're going to focus on today is Longisporum. Um, and this is something that really wrecked a lot of my master's work because it kept on taking over the plates. Um, so a little frustrated with this one, and this is why I'm still super passionate about verticillium and trying to figure out what's going on. 
Um, some key points here. With this particular pathogen, it is a soil-borne pathogen, um, and it does cause vascular diseases in brassica plants, so not just a canola pest. Uh, one of our key diagnostic features for this pathogen is the identification of microscorotia. Um, if we're able to find them uh, in the canola field, that's a really good indicator that we're working with this particular pathogen and disease. Um, as for the disease, there's been a little bit of a name change here and there, um, but we do refer to it as verticillium stripe. Um, this is because we see a stem striping or half stem senescence, more so than wilting symptoms. Um, some other symptoms include um, leaf necrosis, uh, lodging, and, and eventual plant death. Um, but, but these are things that we are starting to identify and find out. Um, this was or is a new disease. Uh, that's why we're speaking about it here in Canada. Uh, so the first field uh, with, an identifi or with a pathogen identification was actually just south of Winnipeg here. Um, and that was back in 2014. Uh, this is not a new pathogen or disease when we look at the global uh, perspective and where we see other, um, uh, other canola being produced. So a really common disease over in Europe. So we've been able to learn from a lot of the work that's been underway there and implement it here. With that, we've been able to develop a uh, verticillium life cycle. Um, so in the essence of time, I'm not going to go over this, but this is a really great resource that you can find um, at the Canola Council website uh, through the Canola Encyclopedia. Um, but kind of two key takeaways, going back to it's a soil-borne pathogen disease um, and that it causes most of its damage up in the stem. Uh, that is where we see the microsclerotia forming. Um, and they're not always super obvious to see. Sometimes you have to work to find them. Uh, we do see them typically move in later in the season or start to develop later in the season. So I, I think in a lot of surveying efforts, we miss the presence of microsclerotia, which really tell us that we're working with that particular disease. So capturing what we actually know, uh, right? We've, we're coming on eight years of working with this particular pathogen. Um, it's been a bit of a learning curve. Uh, there's still a lot of unknowns out there, but we are gaining more, more knowledge and information on this particular pathogen and disease. Um, this is a picture, an image I took back in 2018, same back trying to do some of my master's work, trying to uh, work with black leg and do black leg ratings in the field. Um, I kept coming over these stem cuts or this root tissue that just didn't look right. Uh, it was really complicating my ratings for black leg, um, this grayish brownish hue. Um, and, and this is something that in the literature wasn't really commonly talked about. So this is what I consider an early indicator of verticillium stripe or of that pathogen moving in. Soil-borne disease, so it's coming in from the root, moving through that root tissue taken up into the plant stem. So this is something we now know. This is something that early on in our surveying efforts we can identify and look for out in the field. One of the other big steps and same, new disease, so we're taking baby steps here, um, but just identifying this particular disease to other canola diseases. So lots of confusion still on what to be looking for. Um, when you see them side by side, you can see the, the vast difference here with verticillium stripe, looking for those microsclerotia versus black leg where we see something like pycnidia that are quite, um, quite large fruiting bodies that you can actually feel. Verticillium, you can't. Um, it kind of leaves, uh, leaves a silverish hue across the stem. Um, and we also are able to identify it within that root cross section. This is another piece that is not really well documented in the literature, um, this development of the microsclerotia in the root. Um, so this is something I look for and is kind of my early indicator of that we're dealing with a field that may have verticillium. Another thing we know, so we can now identify this disease in the field, so where is it at? How far spread? What is the disease incidence? So um, Manitoba Agriculture with Agri-Food and Agri Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and Brandon do this really extensive canola disease survey. Uh, this is one of the long-running surveys that happens here in the province. Really um, beneficial to understand what we're working with. So this past season, 2022, um, we're finding more and more fields of verticillium. Uh, this year's survey looked at 115 fields across the province, um, and 38% of those uh, were showing verticillium. So if I, I won't be able to get that to work. I'll go the safe way. Ooh, maybe. Um, so you can see here with the verticillium stripe, uh, this is a really kind of neat graphic to put into perspective 
Um, David Kaminsky had put this together. It's looking at sclerotinia of stem rot and black leg, two of our other major diseases. Um, but you can see over time, so since 2018, we've seen this increase in verticillium stripe. Um, I believe this is for two reasons. We can actually properly identify it now so we know what we're looking for and the environmental conditions. This particular pathogen thrives in these hot, dry conditions that we've been having the last few years. I know it was wet this spring, but it did turn dry. Um, and this is likely why we continue to see uh, verticillium stripe increase. Um, just to note, in Saskatchewan, in their survey, they have not been able to identify it um, through their general canola disease survey. So this year they did a targeted survey across um, or along the Manitoba-Saskatchewan border. Uh, Post-harvest, where it's much easier to see the microsclerosia and, and the disease symptoms, um, and they were able to find it in 64% of the fields that they surveyed. So it is there and it is present, um, it's just not super obvious. So I think if we were to do surveying differently here, um, post-harvest as well, we would see much higher numbers for verticillium stripe. Does it matter post-harvest? No, because the yield that's been lost has already been gone. So this is more of an identification of where you might be seeing it across the province. So we're going to wander in, into the unknown. Um, if you've seen me talk on verticillium before, um, these are kind of remain big questions. These are the questions from the field, not a lot of answers. Um, I've been saying this for five years now. We have research that is funded, it is underway. Um, a lot of work here at the University of Manitoba is happening on this particular pathogen as well. Um, so we're starting to get some answers to these big questions. Um, the environment. Um, so a lot of the work in, in Europe is, is referenced here in this slide. Um, just to kind of set the stage of what this pathogen, um, what it thrives in, what conditions does it do well and spread in. Um, one of the big focal areas is on soil temperature. So um, the, the work in Europe was showing that 15 degree mark is where we see increased colonization. Um, so that's where the roots are taking in, um, taking in the, the fungus. Um, to allow this pathogen to continue to move in the plants, air temperature has to be up and over 15 degrees, um, and kind of that optimal range being 23 degrees. So this is all work pulled from Europe, um, just to, to put that into perspective. So they are growing um, winter oilseed rape over there, not, not spring canola types, but that is just a rough um, guess on, on environment, and then we still are trying to understand how this is going to work here in Western Canada. Um, there is a, a dispersion study happening here at the, the University of Manitoba. Um, it was looking at direction, distance, and time of spread of the microsclerosia. Um, uh, and uh, Dr. Fernando's lab put together a heat graph, and this is where I'll do my interpretive dance. The heat graph was like this. So I'm not sure what to really pull from that at the moment. Uh, it looks very chaotic. Um, it looks like if you were to overlay that with maybe prevailing winds, you'd maybe be able to pull a few trends. But right now, uh, very, very sporadic on the conditions. Crop damage. Um, so same, a lot of work is pulled from Europe on this. Um, some of the early reports show these huge yield um, uh, penalties. Uh, early work showing like 30 to 50% yield loss. Um, as we start to uh, refine and, and have new genetics come down the pipeline, some of that work from Europe was really showing that it was variable um, and, and for the most part insignificant. Um, so, it, we're still trying to figure that out here. Um, both uh, University of uh, Manitoba and Alberta are working on yield loss um, in screening uh, commercial germplasm. Um, the U of A, and, and that's what this graph is showing, and, and from they're looking at inoculation methods, so we're still trying to figure out the best way to work with this pathogen in a lab setting. Um, and they were showing some really uh, powerful yield loss components there. Um, so just trying to reframe and, and uh, you know, figure out what would be the best method to move forward. Resistance. We've been hearing about resistance. Um, you know, that is our go-to tool when managing a lot of these different diseases. Um, this is work done here at the, at, um, out of Dr. Fernando's lab, um, and they were screening commercial lines or uh, germplasm from companies. So all of the colors that are going on in this uh, particular graph are just showing different uh, companies' lines. So don't really worry about the color so much. Look at the disease rating here. Um, so this is on a, a zero to four scale. Uh, a one or a zero is a healthy, clean plant, all the way up to a four, which is showing a lot of microsclerosia. Um, so at that point, um, 
we're seeing a lot of these with a low disease rating. Um, and we've got a Westar score as our susceptible check at a 3.8. So there's germplasm available. That's the exciting part. Um, we're going to see more and more companies start to identify their resistance within their hybrids. Uh, there's a few that already are. So if you're having issues, ask. Um, and with that, I will wrap up. I, I hope to have generated probably more questions than answers today. Um, we'll maybe get to the question period and talk a little bit on management, but our options are limited. Very limited until we get some more sources of resistance um, to use. And with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Justine. Um, she's thrown up a reminder about the uh, poll questions, and you might have caught a glance at the answers to the question that Jim posed earlier on. I think Marla can throw that up on the screen, and we can review that. Um, it looks as though many people feel that the resistance changes fairly quickly from what is shown in um, Seed Manitoba, and uh, I think that's right in line with uh, what what Jim was telling us. So we had about 95 responses to that uh, question. And um, now we're moving on to Justine's question, which was, do you feel that canola acres you manage lost yield from verticillium? I think it's an overwhelming yes. Uh, some don't know, and a few say it didn't. And that's not surprising, because some people with a long rotation uh, don't necessarily see it. But I think those are quite interesting results. Uh, now we're doing the turnover to Dr. Shama Chatterton. She's joining us from uh, Lethbridge. And I don't have the wherewithal to do it here. Our lovely tech crew over there is uh, taking care of us. And uh, Shama also posed a number of questions, or one question. And there are your answers in advance. What do you consider the biggest barriers to growing more field peas and a lot thought that it was disease issues. So it's a good thing that we have Shaman to talk about Aphanomyces in particular. Um, maybe the one of the reasons that field pea production left Manitoba in the first place, it's uh, coming back because of our protein strategy. Have we got Shama on the line? There she is. Uh, sorry, I couldn't be there in person today, but I think one of the great things that we got out of the pandemic was all these options for virtual presentations now. Uh, so I'm going to talk about aphanomyces and pulse crops. And these were kind of the questions that I was asked to focus on. You know, are we looking at a threat to expansion of field pea in Manitoba? Why the concern with aphanomyces? Uh, and then very quickly, I'll go over how we can prevent establishment and what are some prospects for future management. Uh, so I think we all know this now, uh, you know, pulses, there's a big buzz around pulses, particularly when we're talking about sustainable agriculture and reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the benefits of pulses is that nitrogen fixation. That means you don't need to apply uh, nitrogen fertilizer to your pulse crop. Uh, they also use less water. Uh, they can improve soil health uh, because of their um, associations with mycorrhiza and other beneficial organisms. And the, really the big reason why they're so popular right now is because of that great source of plant protein that they provide. <clears throat> so there's a big push by the pulse industry to see pulse acreage increase to 25% by 2025, which is only three years away. Um, and really what that means is that you'd like to see a pulse crop included in your rotation once every four years. Um, so the big problem with pulse acre expansion, though, is what I like to call our root robbers. Uh, it's easier to say than root rot rotters. <laughs> so I shortened it to root robbers. Um, and really, we have a number of players uh, that act as in this gang of root robbers with our primary um, a uh, primary big bad here being a fan of my CZ Tykes. Um, kind of shown here, I like to show it as it's, uh, it really tries to punch its way into those pea roots and it shows no mercy once it's in there, it just kind of dissolves those pea roots away. Uh, it's helped a lot by its accomplices here, Fusarium avanaceum and Fusarium solani. We find them uh, in about 90% of, of uh, roots that are showing some rot. We often find these two organisms. 
And then there's a few little bit players that are maybe just hanging around for the ride. They don't really know why they're there, but they do contribute to some of the severity that we see. And those are uh, players like Pythium, other Fusarium species, as well as Rhizoctonia. And then is really helped along by wet soil, pulse history, and tight rotations. Uh, and when we look at pea root rot, this is often what we see. Uh, it's not common that you actually see it develop so early in the season. Uh, this is actually a picture, I believe, from 2017, where we had pretty uh, a lot of rainfall in May. And so we saw the disease develop kind of in the seedling stage. And here you can see these yellowing of the shoots. There's a picture here closer up to see what that looks like. So you can see here the peas are quite young, about six weeks old. Um, and we see this progressive yellowing of the shoot. So when we dig up those plants to look at the roots. Uh, we can see that they had some really nice nodulation starting, but then you get this root rot here. Um, and there's another picture closer up. And really a phantomyces produces this honey brown caramel discoloration of the roots uh, that looks really wet, um, kind of a watery decay. And then why I like to call them the root robbers is because we can see in advanced stages, you really get no uh, roots left at all. Now it's unusual to see a field like this that has such perfect symptoms of aphanomyces, and this is because it came on very early in the season. Generally, when we pull up our, our roots, we really are seeing kind of a really a mess of symptoms and it's hard to diagnose. So this would be something that's okay, very obvious to be aphanomyces, but most of the time when we're pulling up our roots, it looks like this, and it's really a combination of fusarium uh, and aphanomyces. And fusarium causes this blackening of the taproot, whereas aphanomyces really kind of eats away at the roots and, and leaves nothing behind. So why is aphanomyces our big bad? Why is it such a problem? And really the issue is these pesky little ooze spores here that we see get left behind in the roots. Um, and if you look closely, you can see they have this very, very thick cell wall. And this allows them to survive in the soil for quite a long time. And they'll just sit there waiting for the perfect ingredients, which is pea roots or lentil roots or any host that's susceptible. But uh, for us, we're mainly concerned about peas and lentils. You add that, that to the mix and you add water and these ooze spores germinate to produce uh, these clusters of zoosporangia. And so you can see that one ooze spore here is producing you know, a thousand uh, of these little zoospores in, this, in these zoosporangia. And then if you look really closely, they get released you can see them here on, um, they have flagella and they actually swim and find those pea roots. And then they can infect very, very rapidly within seven to 10 days. Uh, we can see kind of complete destruction of the roots. And then once they've used up all that juicy uh, root tissue, then they go back to producing those ooze spores that sit in the soil. So what's the story for Manitoba? Um, as David said, it was actually, uh, you know, it's fairly new to Alberta and Saskatchewan, but it was known to be in Manitoba in the early 90s and did curb some pea production there. Uh, and now we're seeing a renewed interest in pea production. Uh, and so we went and had been doing surveys for a few years. It's actually a group at AFC Brandon that does the surveys, then sends them out to us uh, for testing for aphanomyces. And what we can see is that the prevalence and incidence uh, really tracks with the amount of precipitation that we get within a year. Uh, so 2016 was a very wet year and we saw high prevalence of incidents. 2017 and 2018 were quite dry years and 2019 was somewhere in between. Uh, we're still catching up on root samples from 2020 to 2022. There's a backlog when we weren't allowed in the labs because of COVID. Uh, so I don't have data from there, which is looking at the precipitation patterns where I think 2020 and 2022 were fairly wet. We would expect that we would see kind of that high uh, prevalence of incidents. And if we look at that compared to what we see in the prairies um, here, every red pin is a positive aphanomyces field tracked over five years from 2014 to 2018. And the yellow pins are lentils. We can see that this is a prairie wide problem. And then Manitoba is over here, uh, not quite as many pea fields uh, just because the, the acreage isn't as great. So uh, we've kind of shown that, that uh, aphanomyces unfortunately is everywhere that peas or lentils are grown. Um, but if you're a lucky producer that maybe hasn't grown peas for a number of years, or you're just thinking about starting to grow peas, the question is, can establishment be prevented? And the answer is what any plant pathologist will tell you is rotation, rotation, rotation. 
So that is really the most important factor in preventing root rots. Um, there's not a lot of data to kind of pinpoint how many times uh, can you include a pea in a, in a field before you at risk. Uh, there's data from the 90s that showed that frequency of susceptible pulse crops in the cropping history was pretty important. But some fields, it took like kind of uh, three times before you got a problem. Other fields, it was six to seven times. So uh, we haven't quite figured out why some fields seem to be more susceptible than others. One thing that is really important, though, is soil moisture during that last pea or lentil crop. So if you had a pea crop in 2016 and it was really wet, it means that your risk of having root rot, uh, the next time you put peas in that field is much higher because that moisture was there. Um, I think with a lot of farming, sometimes it's just a little bit of luck. I'm not very scientific, but uh, we just really haven't been able to pinpoint why some fields kind of reach that threshold faster than other fields. Uh, the other thing that is really important though is the movement of soil and equipment from an infested field to a, a non-infested field. And I think everyone's familiar with the idea of kind of club root uh, biosecurity principles around uh, preventing club root. And so the same thing does stand for phanomyces. And I just wanna highlight uh, this idea of the environment the last time peas or lentils are grown. So we do recommend that on top of keeping track of your rotations and maintaining good rotation, you also do keep track of those wet years when your fields may have had flooding or saturated soils. Um, this is an example of a field near Lethbridge in 2020. Uh, I think I was driving back from the beach and we saw this and I stopped because it was a really nice example of little yellowing patches within this field. And 2020 was a really wet year in Lethbridge. So I would caution this producer to not put peas in this field in 2024 because those wet, those small patches can really spread because of that wet year. So when you're thinking of the fields that you want to plant for pea or lentil in 2023, you have to think back to how wet was it in May and June, the last time your peas or lentils were in that field. Um, and this is just an, another example of that, kind of showing some different options of what fields can look like. Uh, here, if you have a nice healthy pea field, then I would say, go ahead, it's safe to plant pea or lentil in that field in 2023. If the last time you had peas in that field, it looked like this, we can see big empty spots, the yellowing uh, loss of shoots, then I would say definitely do not plant pea or lentil in that field in 2023. The trickier fields are ones like this, where we see these yellowing patches that often occur at like sites of field depressions or here along water tracks. Those ones are the harder ones to make decisions for. And so what we recommend here is to soil test uh, those fields, uh, focusing on collecting soil from these areas of depression and from the water tracks and then there's a number of labs that offer a test for aphanomyces. Um, and right now they can really only offer you kind of a presence or absence. Uh, quantification is something we're working on, but it's really quite tricky. But for now we're saying, you know, if aphanomyces is present, then be cautious and, um, you know, to lower your risk, wait to plant peas on that field. Hi, Sean, so that brings here. us... Yes. Are you getting close? Yeah, um, this is, I was just gonna say, this brings us to the last slide. Okay, so, great. Yeah. So that brings us to the prospects for future management and really all that we can talk about for management right now is crop rotation. And that is crop rotation in terms of avoidance. So remove pea and lentil from rotation for at least six to 10 years if you know that you have um, pea root rot in your field. Um, and this was just a kind of a summary slide. So I'll skip over that and then just say thanks um, to everyone for listening. Um, and, when our days are nicer, I spend my day hiking. And it's a good thing that uh, we have winter time or else I would be hiking and not researching. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Now, a number of questions came in um, over online and I think that Tammy will read out a couple of them. Yeah, so Justine, you need to be ready for a fairly hefty number. Um, but let's talk vert, stripe, and black leg. Uh, what's the connection? Is it a strong tie? Uh, does vert spread by water? Is it more noticeable just because we're going straight cut instead of actually swathing? And uh, what do we do about crop rotation? Is, is that an option? Okay, lots of great questions, and I knew that was going to happen. Um, 
verticillium and uh, verticillium and blackleg, uh, we do find them in a lot of fields together. Um, if you look at prevalence of blackleg, it's an 80 plus percent. So uh, it is there and prevalent. Um, it's probably just a mix of two. Uh, when you have plants that are stressed, it opens the door to others. Um, so researchers are looking at the relationship between the two. Um, that being said, you can find fields where there's no black leg and just verticillium. Um, management wise, so soil borne it is going to move in the soil. May it be in the wind, the water, on equipment. Um, so very similar to club root in that type of management. Um, but that being said, we cut through the inoculum source at harvest. So we are cutting right through all of the microsclerotia and they are going everywhere. So managing that is going to be pretty well impossible. Um, we look at rotation. So even if you're on a great rotation, your neighbors are straight cutting or delayed harvest and for harvesting later into the season, microsclerotia are going to be going everywhere. And that work here at the University of Manitoba that's underway, that goes back to that heat graph, it was just all over the map of how this uh, particular pathogen is spreading. I think, was that all, Tammy? <laughs> Somewhere in there? <laughs> um, so then it's just which came first, the chicken or the egg, with the vert stripe and the black leg? And if you have a better black leg package, will that help with vert stripe? I know. Uh, so just trying to figure that out, um, if you've got a really good black leg uh, disease package, are the genes similar and will there be something in the background that'll help? Um, these are different pathogens, so you are going to have different major genes protect for them or against them. Um, so like I said, that's something we're still exploring. There's likely a lot of um, genes in the background that are playing an effect here on a quantitative perspective. And so when you've got new advanced genetics on the black leg side of things, you're hopefully carrying in some of those other quantitative genes that might be managing for verticillium longisporum. Okay, and then the last, the very last part is most fungicides are group three, so change fungicides are change fungicide groups, and I don't know who that's for, so I don't Not verticillium, because you cannot gonna... manage it with a fungicide. Yeah, so I'm going to assume gene. that's <laughs> Mr. Menzies. As far as I know. I would check with your provincial specialist. <laughs> he just threw up his hands, too, if uh, you're online and you can't see I that. I believe they might be uh, group three right now, um, but we'll see as it develops. And the reality is, and you didn't hear that from me, other fungicides can be used, but they're not registered. <clears throat> and more and more fungicides are being registered that have multiple modes of action, and uh, that is one other way of doing resistance management. Oh, I see that um, Marla has some lovely gifts for our speakers. I'd like to thank them all again. Shama, I guess we'll be sending you yours through the mail.